On this episode, we discuss the crazy story of the Thai soap star who started a full-blown diplomatic incident with Cambodia. So if you're interested in contemporary history and want to learn more about the fragile relationship between Thailand and Cambodia, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawa crap, my voice be coming at you from the Bangkok podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who followed a friend to Thailand in 2001 and took out a loan with a coconut mafia that I'm still trying to pay off, so I haven't been able to leave. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 19 years ago, fell in love with the inaccurate signage at Thai shops and restaurants, and never left. Maybe because he can't leave because he don't know how to get out. <laughs> That's right. The, the signs are so inaccurate. <laughs> anyway, uh, we want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Rando Wick, who I got to say has got a pretty cool name. I like it better than, than John Wick. Oh, Rando Wick. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's his brother, maybe. Who supports us at the show shout-out level. Stick around after we're done talking about the insane soap opera riots of 2003 to hear why Rando is a very likely a perfect mix of Greg and Ed. So a huge thanks to Rando and all of our patrons who support the show. For more info on how to become a patron, just head to the support page on BangkokPodcast.com. And of course, one of the cool things our patrons get is an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we talk about current events in Thailand and whatever else comes into our minds. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about some of the silliest laws that Thailand is about to implement including the TM30 form, smoking indoors, and the plan to ban stuffed animal claw games. For real. Going after the big fish. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, before we jump into it, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to, I'm going to call them the Bangkok Podcast official family. Wow. uh, Yeah, we have an official family now. We have an official boat. That's the Daisy May. That's that's our buddy Ash's boat who, who drives up and down Manhattan. But we have now a Bangkok podcast official family, and that is Ty, Ray, Jenny, and Alex. They are some of our uh, patrons from Florida, and they were in town a while ago. And I was very lucky to be able to go out and uh, have lunch with them. And uh, just a really super cool family, Uh, really cool people. And we had a very fun conversation walking around Icon Siam, and we went and had some lunch. And uh, um, Jenny is going to be a pilot for Thai Airways one day. So. uh, I think I heard her say she's going to give us free tickets. Um, I think, yeah, I think that comes with being a pilot, yeah. I think it makes sense, yeah. And uh, Alex is also going to be a samurai a ninja, so he can teach us some cool moves. Whoa. But, um, yeah, really, really cool. It's, I always say it's one of the coolest things about doing a podcast is we have people from all over the place, and, and we do get to meet them from time to time. And these guys were uh, a, a pleasure to meet and get to know. So, hey, guys, you are officially family, and I hope you have a, a safe trip back to the States, and we'll see you on your next trip. So, this episode is another in our series on the strange and often little-known stories from Bangkok's history. Now, for this episode, we wanted to go over something from Bangkok's recent history that has always struck me as so weird, so very Asian, that I thought it would make for some interesting listening. And I'm talking, of course, about the Thai soap opera star who started a riot in Cambodia that led to a military evacuation of Thai nationals in Phnom Penh and a full-blown diplomatic incident between the two countries. Crazy story. I I lived through this, and uh, I just really couldn't believe when it was going on. So, uh, uh, Greg, (laughs) you tell the story. Uh, I did live through it, but uh, you seem to know the details better than I do. Well, I only know the details because I did some research on this, but I was here for this too, but I was pretty new to Bangkok and I was still trying to figure out how to not get lost on the BTS. Like I, I didn't know anything about anything and this was going on and it was sort of like, I knew it was happening and I knew it was weird, but it was still on the periphery because I had more important things to worry about at the time. Um, but, uh, I definitely remember it happening and thinking it was weird then. So it's really neat to look back and be able to talk about it now. So. Before we start, we should cover a little bit of history to understand why the relationship between Thailand and Cambodia has been historically fragile. 
Now, this, of course, is cut way down from the full story, but this is a, a, a general overview. So for hundreds of years, you had the Ayutthaya Empire and the Khmer Empire, and Southeast Asia is apparently too small for two empires. So the Siamese and Khmer spent centuries going back and forth in wars and territorial conflicts. So as time went on, the French became involved in their push to make French Indochina a thing, with the degree of independence enjoyed by Cambodia fluctuating according to the relative fortunes of Siam, Cambodia, and the French. So it gets really complicated, as you can imagine, and involves a bunch of wars and treaties over the years. But the main point is that control over vast regions of Laos and Cambodia bounced around for decades. So at several points throughout history, Siam was indeed in control of Siam Reap province, where Angkor Wat is, and even renamed the capital city of uh, from, from Siam Reap, which means Siam defeated, to Siam Nakhon, which means Siam town. But eventually history played itself out. The French left Asia and the borders between Laos, Cambodia and Thailand were eventually drawn and mostly settled, which is where we are today. So just to be clear to our listeners, now most people know this if you read any uh, travel books, they'll let you know. But as everyone knows, Angkor Wat is one of the key tourist attractions in all of Southeast Asia, and it's located in the town of Siam Reap in Cambodia. And as Greg pointed out, the name Siam Reap actually means Siam defeated. So just think about that for a second. So that would kind of be like if Toronto was named America defeated. Or maybe like, you know, I think a better name would be like if Toronto was renamed, we burned your White House down or something like that. That's right. For real. No, seriously. <laughs> you know, it. so it's like just that name. And if you talk to most Thai people, they might be familiar with the term Angkor Wat because that's what they've heard from foreigners. But Thai people don't call Angkor Wat Angkor Wat. They call it Nakorn Wat. It's like Thai people have their own names for Cambodian things because Cambodia was part of Siam for a long time. So it's a very tense uh, relationship. Yeah, it's a fascinating relationship, and it's super deep and full of nuance and, quite frankly, full of a lot of stuff that foreigners probably just wouldn't be able to really get their minds around fully. So um, so as I was going through researching this, uh, I came across a quote from Charles F. Keyes, a professor of international relations at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he said, the Thais have a long history of looking down on the Khmers, but the Thais have also borrowed a lot from Khmer culture, and the Khmers are resentful of the Thais for not acknowledging what they owe to the Khmer heritage. So that's sort of a quick breakdown of, of where things stand well a simple you know well a simple example of that would be uh, what we mentioned on the bonus show when we talked about uh the thai script which is based a lot on the uh khmer script they're all, they're all one one big sometimes happy family <laughs> <laughs> i think i think occasionally or rarely happy family Right, right. And our, as usual, our usual caveat supply, uh, most of this info is based on various online sources, and our memory is a little bit hazy, so we are not the ultimate arbiters of truth in this story. Uh, if you want to read more about it, there's tons of stuff online and a bunch of really good books. So this whole thing started on January 18th, 2003, when a Cambodian newspaper printed a story that said Thai actress and ice skating champion Suvanat Kong Ying said Cambodia had, quote, stolen Angkor Wat, and that she would not appear in Cambodia until it was returned to Thailand. And I did some reading around in different sources, and um, apparently uh, one source has the quote as being, quote, I hate Cambodians because Cambodians stole my Angkor Wat. If I am reincarnated, I would rather be a dog than a Cambodian, unquote. Well, That's pretty harsh. <laughs> So so now, do you think she might have actually said this, or that this is just some random claim? Well, we'll get into that later, but let's just say that um, hyperbole and half truths are often taken at face value, and and well, in a lot of places these days, but especially in Asia. So um, the report, uh, so like I said, this this was printed in, in, a, in a Cambodian newspaper, but the report was picked up by Khmer radio and print media, and copies of the uh, of the article were distributed in schools. It's kind of weird. So on January 27th, this was a, a, couple, a week and a half after the story first appeared, Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen repeated the allegations, and he said that Suvanet was, quote, not worth a few blades of grass near the temple, unquote. Pretty badass coming from the leader of a country. Right. And um, 
The next day, the Cambodian government then banned all Thai television programs from the country. Whoa. That's pretty huge because a lot, a lot of the countries surrounding Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, they, they don't have uh, a lot of a lot of infrastructure in place to beam these things over. Thailand is the richest country out of all of those. And so Thai entertainment is often the uh, sort of the de facto entertainment in a lot of these countries, soap operas and music and things like that. Um, it does go the other way too, but I think for the most part, I think uh, Thai entertainment is the reigning champ. In this part of the world for no doubt, no doubt about that. So after the uh, Thai television programs were banned from the country, um, people were obviously mad about the quote that this soap opera actress said. But on the day the anger really boiled over, many demonstrators were fueled by another rumor, which was completely false, uh, that was broadcast on the radio in Cambodia, that the Cambodian embassy in Bangkok had been attacked and their countrymen murdered, which, like I said, was not true at all. But with so many rumors and national pride at stake, the situation quickly got out of control. Well, let me say this. You know, this whole story just shows that there is a lot of kind of underlying tension in the relationship between Thais and Cambodians. You know, if if a story like this right. could explode relatively quickly and, and we're like basically fake news is accepted immediately it kind of shows that the relationship is is not a settled one right it's almost like they're like they're just waiting for something to to, to spark it off you know like yes like, yes that's a good I'll way to just, put it I'll, I'll bide my time but once something happens bam i'm right in there no doubt yeah so on january 29th 2003 a mob gathered outside the thai embassy in phnom penh and the police at the time didn't really seem too interested in doing much of anything. So as happened with most mobs, it soon broke into a full scale riot and the mob eventually broke down the gate and stormed the Thai embassy doing some looting before setting the whole place on fire. And uh, fire engines arrived soon after, although not too soon after, uh, but no hoses were turned on the flames. They just kind of stood around and watched and the uh, the police made some some sort of like basic attempts at crowd control. One looter apparently was shot dead during the spree, but no one seemed like they were in too much of a hurry to. You really know, I remember this story. Control. I mean, I was here in Thailand when this happened, and I just couldn't believe it. I was like, "Wait, the Thai embassy in a neighboring country has been burned <laughs> yeah. down." I remember like th- reading like this is a really big deal, right? Like I'm not reading too much into this. Like that's pretty huge. Again, it would be like the U.S. embassy in Mexico or Canada being burned down. Right, right. That's crazy. Um, so after burning down the Thai embassy, the mobs moved on to Thai-owned businesses, including Thai Airways International and Shin Corp, which was owned by the family of then Thai Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat. Um, the mob rampaged through the four-story building, smashing furniture and throwing computers out of the windows. And according to one employee, about 10 employees ran to the top floor and escaped by leaping across a gap of more than three feet to the building next door, which is pretty badass. So can you can you imagine you just at, at work, just typing on your computer and you hear like, hey, the embassy's burned, burned down and they're coming here. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> what do we do? I've heard stories like this before, but it'll it'll always be a country far away. You know, it'll be, it'll be yeah. like it'll be like the American embassy in Iran was attacked, but 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 yeah. not like not the embassy next door. It's it's crazy, and uh, I won't get into too much into this for obvious reasons. But apparently, there was a photograph of a Cambodian man holding a burning portrait of a very important person in Thai culture, and that just didn't help didn't help calm things down. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to inflame things. Yeah. So from after burning down the embassy and uh, looting some of the Thai businesses and and setting the employees up to the roof to escape, um, the mob gathered outside of Ambassador Chachawed Chatsuan's house. And fearing for his life, he climbed the back fence and jumped into a speedboat on a klong and got the hell out of there. Is that right? I did not know that. Yeah, that's apparently. So the Thai ambassador to Cambodia jumped over the back fence on his house, got on a boat and sped away. Well, you think like someone called him and said, hey, there's a uh, Thai embassy has been burned down. One person's dead. The police are here. There's gunshots going off. They've trashed the offices of Shin Corp and they're on their way to you. Like, I'd be like, <laughs> that's crazy. You know, that's crazy. It's just crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So as the violence raged, Mr. Shinawat, that was the prime minister of Thailand at the time, of course, he uh, telephoned his Cambodian counterpart, Hun Sen, giving him an hour to restore order or face Thai commandos 
going into Cambodia to uh, protect Thai interests, which is a pretty serious thing to say. Sure. He then ordered the evacuation from Phnom Penh of 700 Thai nationals who were airlifted out on seven military airplanes that were flown into the country. It's amazing. Okay. I mean, I mean, you made the point during the intro, but it's amazing that the alleged comments of a Thai soap opera actress, which, right. you know, obviously she doesn't speak for the Thai government or Thai people. She's just a random soap opera actress. It's amazing right. that this could lead to this type of violence and just it's an inter, literally an international incident. Right. It's like Antonio Banderas saying something offensive and you're like, that's it. We're off to the Spanish embassy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so right after that, the borders between the two countries at many border crossings were closed to Thai and Cambodian nationals with 5,000 Cambodian traders being turned back at the border. Um, Pretty quickly after that, like within probably the next few hours or the next day, uh, Thai movies were removed from cinemas in Cambodia. Oh, my God. I, I totally didn't know that. They, they took Thai movies out of the movie theaters. <laughs> yeah. Billboards with Thai actors or products were plastered over. Radio stations stopped playing Thai music. Uh, Thai soap, bottled water, and other products made in Thailand or imported from Thailand were removed from shelves. And most importantly, sales of Sing beer tanked while sales of Cambodia's own Angkor beer spiked. Huh. Interesting. So um, that was sort of the height of things, and uh, things simmered along for a little while until people realized that things were getting way out of hand. So the border was finally reopened on March 21st, 2003. This is a full, uh, like, three months after the thing happened. Um, but only after the Cambodian government paid $6 million in compensation for the destruction of the Thai embassy. Can you imagine giving them that bill? One Thai embassy, six million dollars. It's such a strange story, and uh, now I know there's more to the story, but it, to me, the odd thing is that Cambodian people would react to the statement of one Thai person who did not represent the Thai government, didn't represent anyone, and just herself. Right. You know, and it's yeah. not like it's not like actors or actresses are necessarily people you need to take seriously. It wasn't like, right. You, right. you know, it wasn't like a, a revered Thai professor at Chula Longhorn University. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It was just an actress, just a regular person. Yeah. I mean, not not to put down actors or actresses, but the bottom line is it's like they they really just represent themselves. Yeah, they make believe for a living. And again, no offense to actors and actresses, but there's 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 people who have a lot more uh, sway over the reality of, of daily life than actors and actresses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, like there's no reason to take what they say like that seriously. Right, right. Unless it's William Shatner, of course. Everything right. he says should be taken at face value. Or George Clooney. I mean, he's so good looking that anything he says, I believe. I do have a man crush on George Clooney. I'm not afraid to admit <laughs> All right. So, well, after the uh, borders were opened um, and after the compensation was paid for the for the embassy in Cambodia, um, all kinds of finger pointing followed with most people pointing at one person or group saying they wanted to stir up nationalist sentiment to reach some perceived political goal. And I will say, actually, it was this year in 2003, this was a uh, an election year in Cambodia. So all of the conspiracies started flying like, oh, they wanted to whip up public sentiment for this this side or this side or this cause or that cause or whatever. So all these stories started swirling around and no one knows you know, who did what. But the kicker in the whole thing was that there is no record anywhere of the actress Suvenant saying anything about Angkor Wat at all. And the comments were either completely made up or were misunder a misunderstanding of something her character said while on TV. Wait, okay, hold on a second. Let me get this straight. Yeah. Yeah. So the actress may never have actually said this there's no proof that she said any of this in fact she came out and had a held a press conference or she was crying and saying uh, I, I i i can't find the exact quote here but it basically she, she, she said i never said anything like this about cambodia i love cambodia i love cambodian people because of course her show that she became famous from was very popular in cambodia so that was where a lot of her fans were and she went on tv and said like no no i never said that but you know once you once you these things get started they're hard to put back in the bottles wait this is crazy so so this might have all just come from something that 
her character said on a show? Maybe, but they asked afterwards, they asked the editor of the Cambodian newspaper, which first published her alleged comments. And uh, he now acknowledges that its report was probably wrong. And he was <laughs> one, <laughs> eh, what are you going to do? And he was one of about 150 people arrested and charged with incitement to commit a crime, but no trial was ever held and everyone was eventually released. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> Jesus, you know, it, 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 this whole story is, is almost like a, perfect example of why you just should not believe everything you hear you know and and, you know and and, you know and people people bring this up as if it's some consequence of modern times like hey you shouldn't believe everything you believe on the internet but whatever when i was a kid you know people said like what's that old expression like like believe half of what you see believe none of what you hear like literally that was like i learned that when i was a kid like, you know, it, it's, it, it, this has nothing to do with technology. It's just people need to just chill out and wait for the yeah. proper evidence. There's an, old, there's an old Russian saying that an old boss of mine was very fond of saying, and which our dear friend Maria uh, told us when she was here visiting from Moscow, uh, trust but verify. Of course. Uh, of course. Yeah. It's a it's, great one. It, you know, it, like, it's just shocking that... The actress probably never even said it, and it led to like riots, like an embassy being burned, like one <laughs> like military evacuations, like one person actually being killed. But I got to say this: uh, besides the fake news angle, it does kind of show the tension between Thailand and Cambodia. Yeah, and of course, uh, we could probably do a whole another show on the Prey Wehan. Um, thing a few years back, you know, where that temple that was in like just over the border in Cambodia. And there was, there was real fear for a while that, that there, there was going to be like a real war between Thailand and Cambodia. We should do another history episode on that. I mean, our, to our listeners, basically there was a, there was a temple basically on the exact border between Thailand and Cambodia that they almost went to war over not that long ago. So maybe we'll do a history episode on that later. Yeah, that was really interesting. And people were really scared then. Like, you know, several people died. Soldiers were killed, I think, on both sides. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, this is a crazy story. After that, I think things eventually calmed down. But it is a very good example of how, how quickly things can kick off here and how, like, centuries of resentment and relationships and perceived slights and, and what have you can, can often play into things and they can get out of control real quick. So, um, you know, keep that in mind next time you're, but next time you're talking to, uh, someone about something that can be misconstrued or taken the wrong way. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And as I was doing some research, uh, I actually came across a story in the Irrawaddy, uh, which is a great, a great website from just this past month, actually. And, uh, it summed everything up by saying, but at the heart of all these regional woes is grave ignorance. Not enough Thai people bother to find out about Cambodia and vice versa. The result is misunderstanding between cultures and worse, xenophobia. A sense of inferiority among Cambodians is not surprising. Everywhere in Cambodia, there are motorcycles on the streets, but virtually all of them are made in Thailand. Khmer food is seen as inferior to sumptuous Thai fare. Now, imperialism from Bangkok through soap operas, popular music, mobile phones, and a Thai stranglehold on bits of the local tourism industry has clearly got under the collar of some Cambodians. For decades, Cambodia was in the hands of a series of foreign powers, so a sense of sovereignty is a precious thing. No doubt, uh, no doubt, uh, Cambodia, like all countries, is kind of fighting for its own identity and trying to figure out uh, how to define itself. Yeah, yeah, and they've got a pretty uniquely horrible history too. So I don't. It's not. It's not like they're uh, doing anything unusual. They, they, they've had a. They've had a rough go, and I don't blame them for trying to sort of put their foot down when they feel they can. For sure. Crazy story. All right, let's get into some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us surprises the other with a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept it as just a part of the crazy tapestry of Bangkok. And this week, it's my turn, and I'm going to go with something super easy, Ed, that I don't think we've done before. One word, sometime. Wow. Uh, Oh, I like this. I like this uh, strategy. So this is kind of the... uh, it's kind of the curveball that's, in a way, kind of obvious. Right, you right. Know, it's as basic as you can get. 
Yeah, no, this is great. Um, okay, so I know you're a vegetarian. So for those that don't know, Somtam is the is the very famous Thai dish of like it's a, a grated papaya mixed with juices and peanuts and limes and tomatoes and various other ingredients. It's sort of like a staple of the Thai diet. Yeah, you know, Somtam is a bit hard to explain. I mean, I think it's something that all tourists should try. Uh, I think it's roughly translated as just a papaya salad. But it's uh, it's quite unusual. It's uh, it tends to be very spicy. It has fish sauce in it, which you and I are not big fans of. Um, right. And it uh, it there's a lot of variations of it. So it, it can be served with like meat and fish, and there's you know sometimes it can be you could do a vegetarian version, uh, except for the fish sauce. There's a lot of variations of it. Okay. Right. Sometimes there's little those little dried shrimp in there that I'm That's not right. a big fan of. So. That's right. So I'm going to say this about uh, Som Tam. When I first got here, uh, it was just too spicy for me. But the bottom line is, once I eventually got into it, or once I eventually tried it, I should say, I wasn't that into it. You know, it's like really there were other Thai things like uh, Tom Yum or Tom Ka that I just liked a lot more than Som Tam. And so... You know, it's weird. Even though I never personally got into it, I think Somtam is kind of cool because it's it's so unique. I've never had anything like Somtam anywhere else in the world. Like it's yeah, I agree. So I, I think that if you're a tourist or or anyone, you have to try Somtam. And, and I mean, if you don't like spicy food, you need to specify to lower the spice level. But it's it to, does, to zero. I think Somtam is cool. It's unique. It's unusual. It's just, I've never had anything like it. But the bottom line is, I don't like it. I personally, so I don't really like it. Well, let, let me describe how I feel about it. Because I think, I, think I, I think we're on the same page here. Because okay. like, like I'll, I'll happily eat a plate of Somtam if it's ordered. If it's not like the plara or the pu, like the, the fermented crab one that just reeks and is disgusting. Like if it's a fairly standard plate of Somtam, I'll happily eat it. But I I rarely order it, right, so I've been right. thinking about this. Like I'll 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 probably solidly go with live with. Like I'll eat it if it's at the table, but I'm not going out of my way to find it, and I'm not or I usually don't order it. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm solidly live with. You know, I, I think I'm gonna say I'm gonna say live with as well because I don't really I, I don't loathe it, uh, but it's just something. It's something that I just can't get into. <laughs> to be yeah. honest, you know, it, you know, this is a, maybe a bit a, a a bit of a stretch, but it's like. You know, we've talked before about, I think we've talked at times about like Thai country music, or I don't know if we've actually talked about it, but it's like, it's kind of the same thing. Like, I appreciate it. I get it. I think it's, it's unique. And then I try it and I'm like, eh, eh, (laughs) I'm just not, I I don't hate it, but it's just, I don't want to, I don't want to go out of my way and order it. Whereas, yeah, we're on the same page. Whereas Tom Yum, I really like Tom Yum. I'm I'm all about telling yeah. him. That's a love. That's a love. But uh right. so I'm gonna go sometime. I'm I'm just gonna go I'm gonna go live with. That's that's where I'm at. All right. Fair enough. All right. So we mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh we'd like to say thank you to Rando Wick for lending us his support at the show shout out level. And Greg, what did you find out about Rando? Well, actually when I first saw the name Rando come across the computer, I thought I thought it was an alias or like a made up name like some random guy, like Rando guy, but that's his real name. Apparently cool name. Yeah. It's a cool name. Rando wrote me a nice letter. And uh, the more I read, the more I started to realize that Rando is actually like a better version of us. Really? He's like a better Greg and Ed. Is that possible? Yeah. He's like Gred. <laughs> really? Gred. Okay. Yeah, he's Gred. I'm all, I'm all ears. So check this out. Rando says he's, uh, he's from Seattle, the Pacific Northwest. And I partly grew up in Vancouver, which is just a few hours North of there. He said he's always disliked hot and humid weather, same as me, and that he's come to love air conditioning, same as me. You know, I never had air conditioning in Canada. The first time I ever experienced air conditioning was in Thailand. Well, you know, Canada is a pretty cool country, as they say. So Yeah, most of the time. But sometimes it gets real hot, and we just have to turn on the fan. So, yeah. Um, He moved to Thailand when he fell in love with a Thai woman and married her, same as both you and I. There you go. Right? And uh, Rando is also a political science major with a law degree. There you go. Same as you. There you go. And he finds the politics back in the U.S. very tedious. 
Same as I think most people live for now, sure who <laughs> live outside of the U.S. And um, Rando says he's also becoming much more Buddhist by learning to just relax and enjoy life more, which I think we're all trying to do. For sure, Rando's got like he's got like the coolest elements of you and me mixed together in one guy. Well, you might you know if you t- if you took the coolest parts of me and you, you might end up being a little bit cool. I think so. I mean, you might end up being a little bit Rando. <laughs> <laughs> but the the where where Rando is different from you and I, as uh, he says, he is a gym rat. He's obsessed with going to the gym. So we do not have that in common. Fo show. Wow, you know, I want to say I like him, but just he's got so many positive qualities. I'm getting that kind of uh, maybe I don't like him so much. Yeah, it's like, oh look, another handsome, successful, fit guy. Oh, yeah, great. That's really. What I, that's what I need more of in my life. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Well, Rando, thanks for supporting us, buddy. We really appreciate it. And um, he he says he's built a house up in northern Thailand, which sounds really nice. Actually, it's like the second time I've talked to someone this week who's who's built a house way outside of Bangkok, up in the cool, refreshing mountain air, which is sounding increasingly more attractive as I get older. So I might have to follow your lead there, Rando, and re, uh, relocate the Bangkok podcast intergalactic headquarters to Nakhon somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we wrap up. I'd like to give, of course, a special thanks to Rando, but all of our other patrons as well. As you know, we don't run ads or have sponsors, so we really, really do appreciate the support we get from our patrons. If you want to learn more, just head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. And if you want to get in touch with us, it's easy. Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We're very polite, and if you write, we will answer. Yeah, you can also find each episode on YouTube. We're up to almost 200 subscribers now, which is pretty cool. And uh, you can also follow us online where we post each episode and carry on conversations with our listeners if they so choose. You can also reach out to me directly on the Twitters where I am BKK Greg. So thank you for listening, everyone. We'll see you back here next week. Absolutely. I got a nice pillow that I sit on for my podcasting, but it's becoming flat after years of my fat ass squishing it down. You have like a, more. you have like a taint pillow. It's the name of my new punk band. Taint, <laughs> taint pillow. I love it. That is a great name. That's a great name for a punk band. <laughs> so it's like taint the taint. Pillow. The taint needs help. It needs support, man. That's right. It's the bra of man's elf. This chair comes with a lumbar and taint support. It's like a little <laughs> a little thing poking up in the middle of the chair. Uh. <laughs>